Yeah, and you're. Namo Sasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Nasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Namo Sadanto Suchedoye, Allahadi San Miao San Putoshe. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa, Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu, Wu Jin Jen Wan De Shou Chi, Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Reverend Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, May 24th, here in the Gold Coast, Saturday, May 23rd back wherever you are, unless you're listening from Asia. Uh, and happy to be uh, joining you to look into the Vajra. <laughs> I'm on a, a Diamond Sutra track, looking into the Avatamsaka Sutra today. Da Fang Guang Fo Hua Yin Jing. We uh, uh, have been talking about our Sutra in terms of um, explaining a sutra. We've, I've been uh, using the window of sutra lecturing to, to provide another, another, open another door into our text for those of us who uh, might at some point find ourselves uh, investigating the sutra together with friends. And what are some of the traditional ways of doing that? How did, how did Master Hua, for example, um, having been thoroughly uh, trained in the Tiantai school, the heavenly vista school of sutra explanation of exegesis, right? Um, called the Jiao Zong in Chinese, the teaching school of the people who look into words the Buddha said. Um, Master Hua was perfumed with that, the incense of the teaching school and passed it on uh, made it a point to pass that on in America. So uh, when he arrived, so we're carrying that on. And 
uh, on yesterday night, yesterday in, in California, last night in California, Marty Verhoeven is explaining the Avatamsaka Sutra and uh, Jin Fu Usher, our, our bhikshu uh, at the Berkeley Monastery is explaining the, uh, one of the Amitabha Sutras. Uh, so we've had lectures on the Medicine Buddha Sutra and we, uh, uh, this is clearly uh, one approach to Buddhism, right? You, we like to meditate, but we also like to listen to, to words the Buddha said and to match our thoughts with them, put our thoughts up against that template and see how they adjust, kind of like transparency overlays and you look down through them and look at your wisdom and see how, how, your, how my wisdom matches the Buddha's wisdom. So how do we do that? I've been talking that way. So uh, today, just before we start, let's review what that includes. What do we got? Well, you had a Dharma request just now. That's the first step, Qingfa, right? And uh, Samantabhadra tells us to do that, our Bodhisattva teacher. So then uh, we invoke spiritual presence. We ask the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to come and attend, to, to show up and, and bless all those listening. Um, we're here in a beautiful sacred space to do that. Um, wherever you're listening, um, your mind becomes the bodhimanda, right? Your mind becomes that sacred space where you want to clean it up and get it ready for, for the Buddha's wisdom to arrive, for the three jewels to arrive, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Then what else? Then we read the text. Uh, we go over it linguistically, look at the language used. And I've got some new and in interesting inputs for that today. Then we go back through it again and go for the meaning to bring it to light, bring it to life. And as I said before, the, the quality of uh, bringing it to light depends on stories that you, that I perceive in the world around me. Uh, oh, that makes me think of, oh, that reminds me, oh, this is like, right? You, we draw the connections to the world around us and, and the sutra becomes relevant to, to our daily experiences. And the principles, the wisdom in the sutra just makes, makes it come clear. Uh, the Chinese word for it is tong. It just, it connects, it penetrates and it, it makes sense. So that's, that's the lecture. So what have I got today? Um, as I mentioned the last two weeks, we're into the lists. We have lists of 10 of this and 10 of that. Seven kinds of wisdom, 10 varieties of each. Uh, seven categories of wisdom, 10 varieties in each category. So it's a long series of lists. So how do we bring that to life? Um, we, uh, I prepared uh, some stories and also two songs. So that's what I've got in mind. And with the Dharma request and the uh, request that I'm doing silently while uh, today it was Sam is doing the chanting for, for everyone to join in. I'm asking for insight and help so that the things that I say will connect with the chemistry that the audience brings. So the sutra, the lens that my cultivation provides, what more or less of it, right? And then the, uh, the consciousness and the, the interest that everyone, that all of you bring, creates the mix that is the sutra lecture. You could say the banquet of dharma that is being served up. Tasty, hope so. Nutritious, hope so. Fun to listen to, good to eat, hope so. So let's see, let's get into it. Here's, um, here's our text. I'm gonna come back to page 28 and 29 after our invocation, which is up at the top of our text here. Here we go. That's our melody, right? Played on a tech head banjo. We ready? Here we go. Namo da fang guang fo wan jing, wan 
So I have, uh, this, this is a funny thing to, as we're appreciating uh, all of the conditions that allow us to investigate the sutra, I'd like to appreciate my laptop. <laughs> I have a, a faithful MacBook uh, Pro that I've been using for five years now. And uh, gee whiz. Uh, technology doesn't stand still. They're always improving the, the offerings of each new iteration of laptop. But if I could have just replaced this one that I've been using for five years, I would have grabbed it. But uh, it is now ready to be replaced. And uh, I just wanted to salute this faithful tool that has carried me around the world and provided text and stories and songs and photos all this time. And, and that's funny to, to feel grateful to a machine, but you bet, uh, faithful and hardworking, diligent. Couldn't ask for a better, better computer, but uh, time for it to, to find a new home and uh, be replaced. So this is the last lecture of this lovely tool that I've been using. We are here on page 28 and our bodhisattva, everybody knows where we are. We're in the 10th stage, the 10th ground of the Flower Garland Sutras, 10 stages chapter. The bodhisattva is uh, being trained now. Uh, his, uh, he's being prepared and trained for the teaching that he or she is going to do in whatever body is appropriate to do that teaching in. And uh, we're running through the things, the kinds of wisdom that this bodhisattva possesses at this point. And uh, here is, last week we looked at seven kinds of wisdom, the wisdom of accumulation, the wisdom of change, that's where we've gotten so far. The next is the wisdom of sustaining, holding on then the wisdom of subtlety, then the wisdom of what sounds great, secret places. That's fascinating. Huh? And then the wisdom that integrates with eons of time, and then the wisdom that integrates with the Tao. And how about that? I mean, we'll find out what that means when we get there, but my goodness, I mean, integrating with the Tao, huh? What in the world could that mean, right? So let's start today with page 28, the sustaining of the Bodhisattva's wisdom. Here we go. Chinese goes like this. Yo, ru, shi, zhi, fu, chi, fa, chi, sung, chi, ye, chi, fan, nao, chi, shi, chi, yuan, chi, gong, yang, chi, xing, chi, jie, chi, zhi, chi, Okay, here we are. The Bodhisattva, there we go. 
Uh, bring it out here. Okay, here we go. He also knows, as they truly are, the sustaining of the Buddhas, the sustaining of the Dharma, the sustaining of the Sangha, the sustaining of karma, the sustaining of afflictions, the sustaining of times, the sustaining of vows, the sustaining of making offerings, the sustaining of practices, the sustaining of kalpas, the sustaining of wisdom. He knows all such things as they truly are. All right. Um, sounds unusual, strange, right? So as I was visualizing this, these seven kinds of wisdom, each one of the stages, each one of the grounds is uh, a new level of bodhisattva's wisdom and function. So it's what the bodhisattva brings to the teaching of living beings. That's what is being kind of inventory. It's like an inventory. You put your tools out on the table and you see what you've got for the task that you're about to engage in. Last week, I think we did making bread as the analogy, right? You lay out the, the, uh, the flour and the yeast and the salt and the sugar and the water and the flavorings and, you know, and you, the bread pan and the, the whatever you're going to spray in the bread pan to make, it doesn't, make sure it doesn't stick and the oven, you know. So all of those tools are there. Our bodhisattva is uh, got 10 kinds of things that are called chi. Um, my Dharma brother, Bhikshu Hung Sho, Kalavinka, the translator, called this adishtana, the, the sustaining bases, they're called. But, uh, and he's got a Sanskrit uh, original that, that indicates adishtana as the, the Sanskrit word that was translated as shi. This is also the name of my Dharma senior, Bhikshuni Hung Chi. This is her name. To hold on to, that, that keeps it gripped, that, that sustains it, that doesn't let it drop, doesn't let it quit, right? So our Bodhisattva puts out on the table so he knows what he can do with it, 10 kinds of things that sustain. And what is he sustaining? Buddha Dharma Sangha, the three jewels. That's good. Sustain to me means keeps it around. Doesn't go away, right? Don't lose it. You're sustaining it, you don't lose it. What else? Karma and afflictions. Look at that. The sustaining of karma. The things that keep living beings, living beings. Keeps us in this realm of samsara. What would that be? Uh, number one is ignorance just a covering we don't know we don't see i can only understand that much anything else i perceive as a threat and i lash out anything else i see as potentially harmful to my power and so i get rid of it like the postal service let's get rid of the postal service because votes might come in against me no we're not doing i won't won't go there won't, won't do politics today but uh that's a limited function because of ignorance because of something that doesn't see the roundness of every dharma. What's good about the post office? I learned that many, 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 many seniors get their medicines through the U.S. Postal Service. Take away the U.S. Post Office, shut it down, privatize it, and the life-saving medicines for elders would be, you know, for veterans, for example. You get you get your benefits, your, your uh, pension, right? Your unemployment for 30 million Americans comes through the mail. Shut down the mail and what will replace? Is that, you know, so the roundness, see, see both sides and be willing to personally take a loss. Mostly what do we give up? Fear. We give up fear because why we see when ignorance is gone, we see the goodness. We see the goodness coming from sustaining things that benefit living beings. So that's uh, clear that living beings karma comes from ignorance, preventing us from seeing the benefits. So we do what? Shifu would say, Master Hua would say, qi huo, zao ye, shou bao. We would have 
the delusion based on ignorance arise. From that, we create karma. From the karma comes retribution. That's called living beings. That's us. That's what most of us do. Um, and if, it's, if we're in an animal's body, and because I'm a snake, then I eat possums. <laughs> and so the cute little possum that comes tonight to eat at my food tray in the dark, uh, we see this lovely, you know, marsupial here. And to, to me, it's like, oh, this is a lovely native Australian animal. I want to keep it, want to sustain its life. To the snake, the python goes, hmm, dinner. Come a little closer, little python. I'll tell you a story, right? And <laughs> so what kind of karma does a living being have when he sees the, the ending of that life as the sustaining of his life. So karma keeps us going, keeps the world turning, right? So it's being a living being. Being a human, what do we have? We have more choices. We have preferences. And I, people say, you know, what, what do you get out of being a vegetarian? Well, I get to choose food that nourishes my body that doesn't involve harm for others. I'll go for it, right? If I can live harmlessly, I'd prefer it. Switch the roles. If I'm the food for another being, I would prefer not to be eaten. Thank you. So I understand that. I can see it. So I'd like to share that with a, another living being who's, for whom life is the most important thing they've got, right? So let, let live and let live. Let the what do we do? How do we keep the, path, the pythons alive? I don't know. How do, what do we, is there vegetarian <laughs> python food? <laughs> Mostly rodents. Can we have a, a, a soybean-based rodent substitute? <laughs> What's that? There we go. Here we go. Next possum. We can have a soy mouse, right? Soy mouse. So I don't know. The possum, uh, the python might go. No, 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 no. I like the old one, so. Yeah, living beings, karma. Thank goodness uh, we don't have to go through snakes' bodies to appreciate the suffering involved in being an animal. So the sustaining of afflictions. Uh, Master Hua would, this is, this is really interesting. Um, going to Sunday school um, as a Methodist, I was tuning in even then to the challenges to the pastor. Uh, first, it was Wheaton Philip Webb was the first, my first Methodist minister, a wonderful man, uh, who was a friend of our family, a friend of my parents. And Pastor Webb was just such a good soul. He just, he radiated goodness as a Methodist minister in, in Ohio. And then he was replaced by uh, Paul Trope, who again was uh, among my parents' friends, Pastor Trope, was, has wisdom. He was a wise man and kind, kind-hearted. Um, and I would tune in as a kid. Still, I'm 13 years old, going to Sunday school and then to, to the, the church service. I was aware of the challenge of preparing the sermon. We called it the sermon. When I became a student of divinity, it, was, it became a homily, right? It, when you're the one delivering the sermon, it's your homily. Uh, so the pastor gives the sermon, and I was watching, what's he going to say today? What's he going to say? And uh, Pastor Trope was uh, in the pulpit during the Vietnam War and uh, had to face a choice of talking true or talking good, you know, talking uh, in a way that pleased the wealthy as well as the uh, as well as the young people who were facing possibility of going off to war if their draft number was called. Right. So, and he was a good heart. He told the truth. Got in trouble with the uh, the local uh, parish, the district. Right. 
So for telling the truth, he was courageous. Anyway, um, where I'm going with this is when I got to listening to Master Hua, listening to uh, Master, uh, Master Hua explain the Dharma, he often talked about affliction. He would talk about, he would say, you know what I want from you? He says, nothing. I don't want anything from you, my disciples. Give, do, yes, I do, he would say. Give me your afflictions. Give me your greed. Give me your anger. Give me your delusion, your ignorance. That I will take. In fact, I, I beg those of you. Give, please give those to me. I will take them on. I will burn them out, burn them away, and leave you with precepts and samadhi and wisdom. He said, uh, no ignorance. So we thought, oh, that's nice, Shrivu. That's nice that you said. And he would say, no, I mean it. He'd say, that's all I want from you. And he would say, why do you cling to your afflictions? Why do you take them as your own food, as your daily nutrition? Why hang on to greed? Don't you see that greed is a poison? You say, the Buddha called these poisons. Why do you want them? Let them go. Give them to me. I'll take them. I can, I can deal with them, he'd say. You know? And I thought, wow, here's Buddhism, his sermon, his homily, for the day explaining the sutra is about greed and anger and delusion. And so is the Buddha's. The Buddha didn't speak good, kind words to make you happy, although sometimes he did. Sometimes the Buddha's talk was just about happiness, about ultimate happiness, about joy, about serenity, right? But often he would say, you know, if it wasn't for your afflictions, you would have wisdom. Too bad living beings can't let them go. They simply only sustain their afflictions, he would say. Right? Let them go. They are not your friends. And right here in our Avatamsaka, um, there's sometimes the sutra will talk the, in, in, through the voice of the Bodhisattva, right? The, uh, where was it? In, the, uh, in, the, in the, the, ten, the ten practices chapter, in the first practice, actually practice of happiness, interestingly. Uh, the Bodhisattva talks about giving, and he goes into this story of living beings, saying, wow, living beings are just pathetic. They're, they cannot see their way through. They're totally tied up, bound up by things that they won't let go. It's not that chocolate sticks to people. It's just that we don't drop chocolate. Not that I'm saying we need to drop chocolate, right? A little bit of chocolate is, if you like chocolate, is yummy. But uh, we blame chocolate for making us fat. We blame chocolate for addicting us to the flavor, you know? It's not chocolate's fault, right? It's, it's we won't let it go. And the sutra says, living beings are lost in the forest of wrong views, right? We take bad friends, as our companions, we turn our backs on good teachers, on and on, right? The sutra reads out living beings. And it's like, whoa, we're being dissed by the Buddha. Right. Because he's saying, there is no other cultivation. Simply get rid of your afflictions and your mind naturally radiates goodness. So it's like, oh, so... In terms of a homily, is that a winner to talk about the, the five basic afflictions and the 28, you know, major afflictions and the, the lighter afflictions? No, it's like, who wants to, thank you, I'll rather go get baptized. You know, at least Jesus brings us good news, right? Mm, yeah, but do we have to wait till we get to heaven to get that good news? The Buddha is saying that if we can let go of our afflictions, excuse me, while I socially distance appropriately. <laughs> if we can let go of our afflictions, Bodhi is right there. Here we are in Queensland. It was down to nine degrees centigrade here yesterday, which is about 
uh, about 30, what, 36, 38, something like that. Cold. But bracing, you know you're alive when it's cold. Yeah. So, sustaining of afflictions. What about the sustaining of time? Time. Interestingly, as I, because this word shi in Chinese is also the name for seasons. The sustaining of seasons, as I saw that. And uh, I have to say, I was raised <coughs> in the Midwest, and we, it's a, definitely a temperate climate. Uh, nothing like the coming of spring out of winter. My uh, father's family is from French Canada, from La Belle Province du Québec, as they say beautiful province of Quebec. And my goodness, the winters there are harsh and long. And when spring comes, mm. moving to California, as I did in 1970 and stayed there till now, essentially, I never got used to California climate. I love the changing of four seasons. And my body expects autumn, that melancholy, bittersweet flavor of autumn coming when you see the geese going south and you feel that chill and you know it's, it's going to get dark by six o'clock and you're going to have to go inside and turn up the, the furnace and, and food changes to autumn food and you start drinking slightly thicker beverages and stuff. That was always a joyful part of being alive in a human body was the changing of the seasons and California doesn't do that. Now, here in Queensland, my goodness, we are living right on the coast. Uh, and the presence of an ocean is a great determiner of the seasons because the ocean doesn't change rapidly. So uh, Queensland has uh, a cold season. It's got a winter. We're in it now, nine degrees last night. So. I'm getting to know. I've never actually been here for a full year to know the changing of the seasons. Maybe this is my first year to experience the temperate climate of the Gold Coast. So, the sustaining of the sea of times, right? The sustaining of vows. Hmm. There you go. Um, the thing about vows is remembering them. Uh, let's see here. So, question. Uh, how do you let go of your afflictions? I'm aware I'm afflicted, but I don't know how to let it go. Is it uncomfortable? It is uncomfortable for the mind. Question, how do you let go of your afflictions? One is you recognize them. Um, two is you make friends with them. Three is you replace them. Right? Um, first, the, recognize, the recognizing of them is... Not simple, because, for example, um, Las Vegas. Anybody been to Las Vegas? Anybody going to Las Vegas? Not this year, right? Poor old Las Vegas. They entirely depend upon people driving in and dropping money there. And when we're quarantining in place, uh, Las Vegas is hurting bad, as are most places that require it tourists to survive. So if you've been to Las Vegas, they call it America's Playground. Um, in 1976, America's uh, bicentennial year, together with two other monks, I traveled across the United States by bus. Greyhound had a bicentennial tour and uh, two other big shoes and I got on the bus in San Francisco and headed east. We went to New York, all the way to New York on the bus. And it was, there was a, a, an Ameripass, I think they called it. And for a hundred dollars, you got to, as long as you didn't go back the, a different direction, as long as you kept moving, we went around the entire United States for a hundred dollars on Greyhound, not bad. Uh, and on the way home, that one of the routes took us through Las Vegas on the way back to San Francisco. So I had never been to Las Vegas in my, I was 26 at the time, 26 years. And so we thought, well, since we're here, let's take a look at the strip. <laughs> oh boy, went into a casino. And uh, 
the, uh, what I saw immediately was gambling is a lot of suffering. Uh, there's always the, the temptation. Lady Luck is going to blow on my dice and I'm going to win. Uh, but what I saw were uh, largely elderly people sitting in front of the one-armed bandits, the slot machines, with gloves on their hand because they pulled that lever so many times they needed a glove to protect their hand from the, from the lever of the slot machine wearing a glove with co empty coffee cans. And the coffee cans are full of quarters. And these, this, I remember seeing this one old lady going down a row of slot machines, putting a quarter in, pulling the handle, putting a quarter in, pulling the handle, putting a quarter in, pulling the handle, not even paying attention. The machine three down hit a jackpot and the quarters were pouring out. She didn't even notice. All she wanted to do was court lady luck. And I thought, boy, that's an affliction. She doesn't know it, right? She is so drunk, so addicted to the promise of easy come easy, you know, of easy money. That's, that's the idea of gambling is, you know, I'm going to get a lot of money for not very much money. Put in a little, it's going to come big. That was the, the uh, virus that affects gamblers, right? And it was so clear to me that this was not fun. If that's America's playground, slot machine gamblers aren't having much fun. Um, that, uh, that promise of something for nothing is greed. And it's a poison, as the Buddha described it, and it gets, it grabs your, your imagination and it won't let go. It's a disease of the imagination. I might get something for nothing. I'll keep at it. Lady luck, you know, luck be a lady tonight. Luck, if you've ever been a lady to begin with, luck be a lady tonight. Guys and dolls, right? Not fun. So first step, do you recognize your affliction? Do you recognize that Las Vegas promising a good time, all of these naughty pleasures, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas, right? I guess... I guess maybe if you don't look very deeply, maybe it's another flavor of fun, great entertainment. You get to draw close to a, a retired celebrity, right? You get to listen to Celine Dion sing. She's a tremendous singer. That would be fun to hear someone, the quality of Celine Dion, another Quebecois uh, singing, you know, in a small venue. That would be okay. Um, but the food was free and we all got indigestion. We had one meal because it was time for lunch and we had to find the vegetarian food, but it all tasted like it had been prepared that morning to be set out all day and, you know, on the buffet. We all got stomach aches because it, something about it, maybe there was a tension in the air or something like that, the tension of maybe this time I'll strike it rich. And, uh, so what about affliction? Do we recognize affliction? Um, I know somebody who recognizes affliction. The sharks that circle around Las Vegas, where money flows, there are human sharks who want to take a bite of that loose money. One of them actually was the father of a bhikshu. I heard this from one of the monks who was with me. He, he was actually the one encouraging us to go to Las Vegas because he had grown up there. Who was his father? His father was, and I, I can tell his name because you won't find him. It's Boob Jones was his dad. Boob Jones. Boob Jones owned a car dealership. And his car dealership was on the edge of town heading back to Los Angeles. And Boob Jones was a wealthy man uh, because why? He had, he, he understood. He was a successful businessman because he saw cars come up from Los Angeles, fancy cars, Cadillacs, Lincoln Continentals, you know, 
rolling into town and he would see the same car coming back towards LA after the end of the weekend. And people would say, uh, I got to sell you my car because I'm in debt now. Uh, it's a late model uh, Lincoln Continental. It's worth $12,000 back then, you know. Boob Jones would say, oh, let me take a look. Yeah, I'll give you 3000 for it. $3,000, it's worth four times. I'll give you 2500 Give me the money. I got to pay my debts. And Boob Jones would get a, you know, late model. His lot was full of late model cars that people had sold for a quarter of their value because they needed the money fast, right? So sharks, that's somebody who recognizes affliction and is able to benefit from it, you know, in a just knowing the nature of, of greed. All right. So how do you sustain affliction? You recognize it. How do you get rid of affliction? You recognize it. And then what do you do? You make friends with it. What did the Buddha say? He says the mind contains greed, anger, and delusion, but the mind also contains the potential for the light of precepts and the coolness and the visibility that precepts provide, the connections. When your mind is calm and collected, you, you see. You see how the pieces of the puzzle fit together. And then the concentration that arises when a disciplined, connected mind is shaped by Dharma practice. That's, we make friends with both the poisons and the disciplines, right? And from that comes wisdom, which is a transformation, a connection to deeper, deeper principles. So that's the second step. First, recognize them. Second, make friends with them. And then replace them with something better, right? Um, let's, let's use uh, harmless eating as an example. Um, what's the best way to make a vegetarian? Is to give them something that tastes just as good as what they're letting go that doesn't involve harming or killing, right? So uh, my dear departed stepfather, Ted, uh, was a steak eater. I think I told this story before, but uh, my stepfather, Ted, great guy, traveled around the world as a, as a, uh, in his various roles. And everywhere he went, he went to Paris. He went to, you know, Barcelona. He went to Rio de Janeiro. He went to Tokyo. Everywhere he went, he would say, oh, dinner? Yeah, I'll have a steak. Oh, I like steak. What have, have you got a steak? What kind of you got? Tenderloin, T-bone, ribeye, what you got? I'll take steak. Here he is in Tokyo. I'll take steak. I heard Kobe beef, right? Give me some Kobe beef. So it's like, try some sushi. No, no, I'll take a steak. So my mom got used to him. She knew how to make him happy. And so it's time for me to graduate with my, my doctoral program. The two of them come out to California, to Berkeley. And so it's lunchtime and we're going to host my parents for lunch at Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. And we have, mind you, we have some terrific chefs at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. They were some of our frontline uh, varsity chefs were here visiting in the Gold Coast just last year. So they gifted us with some, we've got magpies singing outside. They're flying around here. Anyway, so uh, my mom was ready for, for my stepfather to say, I'll take a steak. <laughs> so he didn't, he didn't. He's a gracious man. He's, you know, diplomat. So I carefully selected from our Buddhist fusion vegetarian cuisine, uh, Chinese and Vietnamese fusion with West, Western, you know, accents and put it on his plate and he bravely ate it. And what do you think, Ted, says my mom. He says, boy, this is, this is really good. He says, if I could eat this every day, I wouldn't miss steak, he said. My mother rolls her eyes. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? But what a, what a gracious thing to say, you know. And I watched him 
And he tried it. He was actually tasting the food and he went back for more, which is, you know, more real than the words. He's, he actually got more and ate it and liked it. So what do you do in order to transform your affliction? You have to give it something that tastes as good, metaphorically, as what you're letting go of. You don't, they say, you don't cut off affliction. You can't beat affliction into submission. You have to understand your mind, be kind to your habits, and give them something as good as what you're letting go. And then you will sustain your letting go of affliction, right? It'll, you'll have let it go to next year the same way. It'll really be let go of. So, um, for example... Meditation. If you can sit long enough to where you get the flavor of stillness, you'll miss it when it's gone. Um, partying, right? Partying. What's good about partying? Fun. Parties are fun. The world loves to party. Right? Get together with your friends, loud, dance, have fun, let go of your inhibitions. Right. The problem is the next day you can't really sit still because the things you put in your bloodstream and the, maybe the things you've heard shouting over the music at night or you're exhausted or, you know, the, the results of a party is you're, you're feeling really loose, not concentrated and focused. So when you try to meditate after partying, it's hard. It's hard to find that stillness again. But once you sit to a place where you've had that sense of all yours, home again, meditation puts us home, right? It brings us back home. We have a sense of, ah, that's the most me I've ever felt. That's the most authentic me that I've ever felt. I've never felt more of, a one, of one piece than when I meditate. All my senses are calm and cool. And I'm safe and I'm home and I'm secure. And it's a place that I like. That me that meditates, I like that. If you've had that sense, which isn't hard to get, you just have to sit. Then you go out and you party and you come back and you want to find that me and you're scattered all over the place. You go, maybe party less, maybe sit more. Because after the party, I'm a little confused. You know, it's like, I feel like I lost some, I lost more than I got from the party. Pieces of me went out that I wish I had back, right? So that's an example of transforming afflictions. That's a long, long answer to the question, but I think that's approachable. That is sustainable, right? First thing, recognize them for what they are. Let's say, jiriku, you recognize suffering for what it is. Duanji, you cut off, you transform its accumulation. Mu mie, you long for that sense of home, me and self, and then you shoot out, you cultivate the way that brings it back. So the sustaining of vows, vows, the, the deal with vows is, do you remember them? Do you remember? We had a time at Gold Mountain Monastery when, hmm, what an interesting time. I've actually haven't had this conversation with my fellow senior disciples who were there at the time. There was a period, a period of years at Gold Mountain when Young Americans, like me, hippie types, student types, spontaneously started remembering their vows from the past. What was that? I don't think it was kind of like group hallucination or group hypnosis. He said he remembered a vow, he wants to make a vow again, so I'll do it too. I don't think so. I think it was, there. it couldn't have, so many people would spontaneously say, 
I want to make a vow to translate this sutra. I want to make a vow to uh, bow to the city of 10,000 Buddhas from Los Angeles, you know, something like that. Uh, I want to bow to leave home in every life. These things emerged out of people's consciousnesses like, like what? Like lilies in February coming out of the ground, right? Tubes, tubers coming up like roses in June coming out of the vines. It was an, a remarkable time. And certainly, if you say, what was it? It was the sunlight of a true, good and wise advisor's proximity. Close to a teacher like Master Hua, you had a feeling like the seeds in the ground were quickened. That's the verb, to quicken those seeds. And people would, you know, make those vows. And then there's that, I've, I've said this before, and you've heard this story. Marty tells this story as well, Professor Verhoeven. He would say there was that time when Master Hua, uh, he had just gone through a sickness. Uh, interestingly, he, during a lecture, he was almost overcome with coughing and sneezing and discomfort, got down off the Dharma seat. He hadn't done that in, in our presence before. He said, y'all stick around, I'll be back. He said, uh, you recite the Buddha's name, right? Never would he be sick during a sutra lecture, but he was, and he got down and went up to his, his quarters up on the third floor. Came back down, we were still reciting at 9.15. We stayed over, waiting for Sherpa to come back. The lecture was supposed to end at nine. And uh, he got back on the seat. He said, you've never seen that before, have you? Said, no, sure. He said, yeah, I, I, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, Sherpa, what, are you okay, Sherpa? What happened? He said, well, I'll tell you. He says, you all think that I'm a good, a good monk, right? Good person? Said, yeah, Sherpa. He said, well, I've done everything. He says, I killed people in the past. I used to be a general in a past life. And as a general, I killed somebody unjustly. I shouldn't have killed them, and I did, out of vengeance. And he said, that person just came back for me. This was my time to go. He said, what you just saw was my si bao, right? My ming bao, right? This is, I should have given my life if things were just even, but he said, because I have a little bit of cultivation, I didn't have to give my life back. He said, Da de zainan, bian xiao, xiao de zainan, bian meo. Big disasters become little, little disasters disappear. He said, so I was able to cross over that debt. He said, but I still had to get down off the seat. I couldn't, I couldn't sustain it. I couldn't breathe. breathe. So he said, yep, karma is real. He'd say, don't doubt it for a minute. Nothing that we do escapes. It's all recorded, the good and the bad and the neutral. So he said, yeah, here we are in the midst of a dream doing the work of the Buddha, he said. Why are we here? Together, why did you just witness this episode in my life? He said, because we, he said, in the past, we all made different kinds of vows. Some of you made vows to become monks and nuns in this lifetime. Some of you made vows to become lay people, Dharma protectors and supporters in this lifetime. Some of you made vows to follow the Avatamsaka Sutra, wherever it's explained, you will appear in a form there at the time to protect it. He said, yep. He said, that's what brings us together, honestly. He said, in Vairochana Buddha's Dharma assembly in the past, we made vows together to come to this strange place called America to protect the Avatamsaka Sutra. Because here we are in the midst of a dream doing the work of the Buddha, you see. Do you believe me? He would say, right? So, Interesting, right, what that would imply. So those are vows. Vows, it's kind of like the vows make us. We follow our vows. Um, 
more than the vows follow us. So you think we're hearing beautiful magpie songs. They're, uh, where we're building here, we just placed a magpie nest and they haven't relocated yet. But I think the Buddha Hall is probably where they're going to land. So yeah, here they are. So they have some of the most beautiful songs along with butcher birds, oh boy. Anyway, um, these vows that we make uh, come from the mind, right? The human mind. And the human mind is this incredible instrument that focuses consciousness and says, I will do this. And if you say it, what do they say? Yi xin, you know, chen xin chen yi. Yi xin yi yi. The single mind, the focused mind, we come back. The, that the mind sends out this uh, a disturbance in the matrix, right? A disturbance in the force for better or for, or for ill, for good or for ill. And Master Hua would say, we meet each other again, time after time after time. Uh, I think probably uh, husbands and wives meet that way, meet again. Uh, people who kill each other meet again to repay that debt, right? Uh, great benefactors meet the people they helped, right? So I'm aware as I uh, feed the birds and the possums and, the, the, uh, and don't kill the insects that live in the forest here with me in the bush, that those are wholesome affinities. And uh, maybe I'm, and as I feed, I, I have uh, two currawongs, which are these black, large beaked, yellow eyed birds that live here. We have a, a family and I've seen them family through three generations now. And uh, I take crackers and break off a corner and toss it in the air and the currawong meets the cracker at mid apex of the, of the, of the cracker's flight. They jump up, they're beautiful. We should hire them for the San Francisco Giants outfield. They're great catchers. And uh, so uh, I feed, you know, one, one toss and one Buddha's name, Namo Omi Tofo, and the Kurawang gets it. And they're, they're, they wait for me to come out and play catch in the morning. And I recite the Buddha's name, and I really believe that I'm setting up conditions with these critters that in the future, when they come back in a in a human body, or I come back as a Kurawang, I don't know how it works, right? We'll meet each other again and uh, on the power of the Buddha's name. So how do we sustain vows, right? The sustaining of making offerings. The sustaining of making offerings. The, uh, I'm impressed by, excuse me. This is Oolong Ti. Dongding Wulong from Lugu in Taiwan and Taichung, Deer Valley. Um, I'm impressed in the sutra how important making offerings is. It just comes up over and over and over. Descriptions of the devas just before we started this chapter. As we started this chapter, the devas were making offerings to the Buddha, to the Bodhisattva to be specific. And... Uh, they talked about the songs they offered and the lights and the incense and the flowers and the robes and the garments and the trees and the, the, the music. A uh, tremendous amount of giving. Famous moment in the Pu Manpin, the uh, Universal Door chapter, where um, Guan Yin Bodhisattva gets... Uh, a necklace, a ne not a necklace, a rosary, right? A nian zhu, a rosary of beads from Bodhisattva infinite resolve. And what does Guan Yin Bodhisattva do? She, first of all, she refuses it. But then the Buddha says, go ahead, go ahead, take it. It's not for you. Take it on behalf of the Bodhisattva. You're helping him by receiving the gift. So Guan Yin takes the necklace, the rosary, and immediately splits it in two 
I don't know, it must have been two double strands. I always wonder. She didn't cut it, right? That all the beads fall off, right? No, she takes two strands and gives one to Shakyamuni Buddha, and she offers the other one to the stupa of a Buddha named Many Jewels. And so Guanyin Bodhisattva in the sutra models how to receive a gift and how to give a gift. It's really fundamental, the sense of creating wholesome affinities by sharing things. And of course, what do you share? You share things, you share dharma, explain principles. Then there's that incredible gift of sharing what's called courage, fearlessness. Um, the, uh, the news these days is full of tributes to medical professionals, people in the front lines, the healthcare crisis. And uh, I was reading in the New York Times stories from uh, Queens in New York City, um, a neighborhood that was the epicenter. There was a period in New York just a few weeks ago where a person was dying every two minutes in New York, 800 a day, they counted. Um, during that, the peak, it was the people do that with statistics, right? How many people died per day, per minute, every two minutes, they said. Uh, do the math. I'm just repeating what I read. Um, and the, the stories uh, are the, the kind of thing that you remember the rest of your life, but the, 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 most of the stories are first person um, accounts of what it's like to suddenly have this reality appear in front of you. And the stories are heartbreaking and so touching and so powerful uh, that you just wonder what is humanity capable of? Uh, how strong are we? How, how far do we stretch before we break? What can we put up with? And at what price do we pay? You know, these stories are coming direct. They're hot off the press of people who have uh, been doc doctors and nurses, but they've never had to see their father come in on the ambulance, right? There's a story of a Chinese doctor who's the head of the ER at this uh, hospital in Queens. And uh, his father comes in and he's looking down at his father's face and he has to entube him and put him in a respirator and his father doesn't make it, right? And he, uh, he has to deal with that, but he can't stop working. So uh, how do you, you know, you just wonder. And I can't help as I read these stories, but, I, but identify and put myself in the position, what would it be like? What would, how would I respond, you know, if that were my, my reality, suddenly manifesting in front of me like that? And uh, <coughs> it's, um, you think, who at that point can give courage? Who can, do, who can do the thing that's called wu wei si, san zhong bu shi, ha, fa si, cai si, fu wei si, the giving of courage. Words at that point, especially when you can't hug, you know, traditional thing to do would be to, to offer a hug and, and just let the kind of the contact take some of the pain away. You can't even hug. Now, uh, that kind of contact could be fatal, right? So how do you give courage at a time like that? Um, I wanted to share, that's kind of heavy here. Um, I want to share something wonderful here, which is a way to give courage. And it's called www.karunavirus.com. 
dot org, I hope. Is it org? Make that bigger so you can read it. Uh, coronavirus. Karuna, Sanskrit word meaning compassion, right? Coronavirus, not coronavirus, coronavirus. K-A-R-U-N-A. -A. Let's see if it's .org. Is it .org? You, yeah, .org or .com? .org. Okay, good. Coronavirus.org. Okay, what is it? This is a uh, offshoot of Service Space. Service Space are uh, good friends in the Bay Area and worldwide who uh, are devoted to serving and through to giving, gift economy. And a volunteer said, you know, we really need to, at this time, step up and start collecting the good stories that are coming from, from the pandemic. Uh, the answer to the question, what happens when people are stressed to this point? Well, one of the things that happens is from the human heart comes kindness, compassion, serenity in the midst of disaster and chaos, and sympathetic joy, right? So American Airlines, and let me look here, uh, that down here, just a moment, hide that one. Uh, hold on here. Can I, I'm going to do it myself here. Kcoronavirus.org. There it is. Let's see if we can find the one I was looking for. American Airlines and I believe it was Hilton Hotels decided to offer to every single healthcare worker in New York, a, here, f no, I said it wrong. 4,000 staff at a New York hospital are surprised with free vacations. 4,000 hospital staff at New York City's Health and Hospitals in Elmhurst received a welcome surprise, Hyatt. Hyatt Hotels and American Airlines announced they'd be given a three night complimentary vacation. The two companies collaborated to provide frontline workers with the opportunity to recharge and reconnect with their loved ones. It says, as of May 17th, one week ago, New York had recorded close to 359,000 cases, almost 360,000, and over 28,000 deaths. Uh, every worker at Elmhurst has seen and experienced challenges many of us cannot imagine. They've given so much of themselves and chose to serve their community with care, compassion, and equity for every patient, said the president of American Airlines. When they're able to take a break, we hope the time away will help them and their loved ones recharge. They might feel our deepest appreciation for their sacrifice and heroism. So there is the giving of courage, right? Right there is an example of the kind of the shan yo shan bao, right? Good deeds bring good rewards. Here is the coronavirus website. And you can see all these amazing stories, wonderful stories about Animal Sanctuary uh, that uh, discovered that in Iowa, 100,000 chickens were about to be killed because the poor poultry farmer couldn't, couldn't keep them alive. 100,000 animals are about to be euthanized, right? So uh, Animal Place in California rented two airplanes, went out, picked up 1,000 chickens. The heads of the Animal Place drove in their car to be there when the planes arrived, 30 hours across the country from California to Iowa, and uh, uh, arrived, <laughs> put the, the chickens, these are battery hens that had never seen the sun. They're stacked up four crates high, the top one defecates on the one below and the one below defecates on the one below. And they took the chickens back to California, released them into ground and sun for the very first time that the chickens had ever experienced sunlight and ground beneath their feet. And they are happy chickens, by golly. 
That's the kind of story that comes out of the coronavirus website. 700 some wonderful stories at this point and uh, want people to know about that. So giving of courage, the sustaining of making offerings, right? Now there's the sustaining of practices and practices get better with practice. Practices go deep in our uh, bodies, our neural pathways, our nervous systems, um, our bugs, our metabolism with practice over time. Dharma practice replaces what? Habit. Mindless habit, which is often driven by comfort or desire or the like, right? So sustaining of practices is key to doing what? The letting go of affliction, right? Hard to set that alarm and get up, right? It's cold in the morning. Oh my goodness. But, you know, moms, moms get up and feed the family, mostly. Dads do too. But just how moms do that, They're, they take feeding of the family as important to them as their own well-being. Their well-being is tied into feeding the family, right? That's the kind of practice, that's the kind of resolve and selfless service that's required to sustain practices. The sustaining of kalpas, a kalpa is an eon, and they're sustained by a synthesis, a synergy of the, the beings and the worlds in them. Kalpas are only measured by the beings in the kalpas, right? So we measure time that way. So we sustain them by our doing. A question, if we stop doing, does time stop? If you're, not, if you're no longer there, the self is no longer there to age, if you have realized your dharma body, then what ages, right? Interesting idea. So there is a point in our meditation where we go beyond time and space. Absolutely do. You can step out of it and nothing ages. How interesting, right? Way deep, yeah. Finally, the sustaining of wisdom. Because wisdom is based on principle. Principle doesn't change. Principles are the, the what? They're the landscape. They're the map that we live our lives through with. So the Bodhisattva knows all such things as they truly are. Why? Because he or she is in the process of embodying the stage of the Dharma cloud. They are, they've now been anointed on the crown, their wisdom is developing, and they're about to step into that role of Dharma king so they can teach living beings. Um, can I invite folks to join me uh, in a song that we introduced last week. Um, this is, I want people to learn this one, and I'm going to point out where to find it as well. This is Janice Ian's song. People will remember Janice from the 70s, 60s and 70s, and on through. Janice, is her career is in full swing. She's not Although she's uh, as old as I am, she's, she hasn't stopped producing incredible music. And this is one of the, the new songs that came to her. This song arose. And it's called Better Times, Better Times Have Come. And I translate it into Mandarin. And the fun part is we can sing it in two languages here. This is one of those songs that actually helps you go down the road. Um, I find myself uh, singing it to myself. To myself. Just because it's uh, it kind of it's one of those viral virus songs that gets into your bloodstream and doesn't want to let you go. So.
Better times, better times will come, better times, better times will come. This world learns to live as one. Oh, better times will come. 明天，明天会更好。明天，明天会更好。世界和谐，心大同。明天一定会更好。When we greet. Each dawn without fear, knowing loved ones soon will be near. When the winds of war cannot blow anymore, oh, better times will come. Mendoe kunan hao weju. 朋亲朋好友，不离不弃。道长如苦，马放南山。明天一定会更好。Better times, better times will come. Better times, better times will come. And this world learns to live as one. Oh, better times will come. Though we live each day as our last, we know someday soon it will pass. We will dance, we will sing in that never-ending spring. Oh, better times come. 生死传顺，一息之间。黑暗夜晚，变幻百千。感恩心声，大地会春，明天一定会更好。Better times, better times will come. Better times, better times will come. This world learns to live as one. Oh, better times will come. Do Chinese again. 明天，明天会更好。明天，明天会更好。世界和谐，心大同。明天一定会更好。世界和谐，心大同。明天一定会更好。So that's one of those songs that just kind of gets in there and didn't want to let you go. Good for Janice.、Um, now, what I want people to see is if we go out to YouTube. Let's go out to YouTube. Yes, indeed. There's lots of stuff on YouTube that you don't want to watch. There's a lot of stuff worthwhile. Go, Janice Ian, J A N I S, Janice Ian. Better times. What you find is many, many, many versions of better times. She released this song out to the world. Inviting people to do their version of it, right? So I translated it into to Chinese with Cliff together, and、uh, there's Japanese versions.、Um, there's John Gorka, good friend. Oh, Eric Bibb, wonderful version. Neil Murphy singing it with a fiddle.、Uh, this is Ken Henderson playing it out on auto harp, right? Ako Takenaka. With Toshiyuki Omori doing it in Japanese, you know. Oh my goodness! Just you know, Janice has really done it right. She's now in, injected this song into our social bloodstream and、uh, gone viral like a virus. And、uh, people will—they feel better singing this song. Better times will come.、Um, 
It's worth it to learn songs like this because they pop up at the right time when we need them. And with, you know, something horrific in front of your face and you say, oh, better times have come. She's specific in the song, when the winds of war do not blow, will not blow anymore. Ah, better times have come. So this is uh, a song to remember. Pete Seeger would sing this song loudly, by golly. This is the kind of song that, that Pete would love. Um, since I got the banjo in my hands, I would like to uh, lead us in our Medicine Buddha mantra and Jin Chuan, Jin He, Jin Fo Shi, Jin Wei Shi, I'm going to ask you to talk about the Great Compassion Mantra session uh, when this, when our mantra here is over. So if somebody wants to get ready to talk about that event coming up uh, later on. All right, we ready? Can we do our... Remember uh, Medicine Buddha's mantra for anointing the crown of the head? This is vibrations put in the world first by a Buddha whose name is Baisajiraj Guru, medicine Buddha, medicine, medicine master, the master of healing. And uh, this mantra has more power than a simple song, like better times will come. This mantra is our vibrations uh, originated from the heart of the Buddha. So uh, if we can get this, uh, in our system, this is truly miraculous. Here we go. I Sajay, I Sajay. Gratitude to our staff who has put this lecture together and translated it into Chinese to send it around the planet and to get us up on YouTube and get us up on, on I was going to say go to meeting, get us up on Zoom, 
all of that effort. Uh, and thank you to all of you who took uh, 90 minutes of your Saturday evening or your Sunday afternoon to sit in and listen to the Abhutamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra. Um, our Bodhisattva is uh, gathering wisdom, preparing to go out and teach. So anyone whom you can, uh, anyone whom you can uh, engage and invite to come and listen to the Buddha's wisdom, please do. Um, Berkeley Buddhist Monastery Bhikshu Sangha, who wants to uh, tell us about the, the uh, Great Compassion Repentance mantra recitation coming up? Um, I can talk a bit about it. The thing is, we actually had it already. <laughs> it was actually this morning. Oh, it was this morning. It happened. It happened, oh, yes. No. Um, but people can definitely sign up if you want to recite the Great Compassion Mantra. Oh, my goodness. And, I missed it. Okay. Um, yeah, so it was, it was tell, this morning. At, so it was this morning at 6.30 to 7 a.m. We picked that time because it was the best time for people all over the world, from England, from, um, you know, Asia, in America. I believe we have something like 350, 360 people attend. Okay. Um, and there was about 380 people who have signed up to recite over the last month, totaling about 10,000 Great Compassion Mantra recitations. Hmm. And so working with our um, lay community, we put together a little form so that those who are interested in joining this kind of wholesome way to use our minds sheltered in place and send out good vibes out to the world, you can do so and just register here. And um, our, volunteer, our kind of lay volunteers will contact you and work with you in terms of just making sure we have all the numbers of people collected. And there's also a request similar to how we did the online BASOC about putting people's name in the Buddha hall. We took the people who are participating in this and we have a little, their name printed out and put it on our, our board in our monastery um, Buddha hall. And so people can kind of feel like you're in the Buddha hall too with us <laughs> during your time of recitation. So how was very nice, very simple. Mm -hmm. How many people were joined in this morning? I heard of something like 300 50, 360, and Jing Weisher, I think, called called an ask. Um, I, think, I think it's around 300 plus. Yes, Jing Weisher, I'm not sh sure, but I think, if I could remember, it's around 250 or 300, something like this. Tremendous. Yeah. Wow, that's great. And how many mantras to date have been recited on behalf of 10,000. 10,000 10, great compassion mantras. Lovely. Yeah. yeah super. This so form, if people languages. can see in the chat box, um, if you are here, what I will do, not everybody is able to see the chat box here. Um, I will copy that, uh, but now you're going to have to... Run off along. I, I didn't make a simpler um, link, just that goes directly to this form on our Berkeley Monastery website. Yes. So we, can, we can update it as necessary, but it's berkeleymonastery.org slash GCM. Great compassion mantra. Oh, so this, because this, look at that link. Nobody's going to Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what I realized. So that's I made it uh, okay. a kind of a, a so, simple placeholder on our website. Yeah, so Berkeley go Monastery. to berkeleymonastery.org. And when you get to berkeleymonastery.org, you find? You to push a slash GCM. I, I was going to put this up after okay. we have our Sangha meeting, but if you okay. want to show Slash G C M. Oh, slash G C M. Yeah. Forward slash G C M. And there's our form. Okay. There it yeah. is right there. And you can sign up below. Yeah. And you click on that and up comes the form. Okay. This is, that's an, those are images of the Guanyin Bodhisattva altar at Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Okay. Thank you for that. Glad to hear. How many folks online today have joined in? To how many? 75 in China, listening to the Mandarin webcast. Ramah Hongshu? Yes. Hi, this is Jin He. Yes, Jin He. Um, I have an announcement regarding the Medicine Master Buddha classes. Okay. Uh, the classes will resume on uh, this coming Saturday, and we've changed it to a weekly schedule, and it will be... Um, one hour long. 
Uh, sorry, let, let me let me correct that. We, we've changed our weekly schedule. Uh, will be an hour-long class. And uh, the next class will be on the following two Sundays. And then um, we're going to move to Saturdays after that. Uh, for people who need who are not on the WhatsApp group and you need to find out, please visit BBM online. It's been updated for the new dates. Okay, people who would like to hear the Medicine Master Sutra explained, in English, um, they will resume. What was when do they resume? This coming. This coming Sunday. This coming Sunday. Okay, yeah. that's tomorrow. In other words. Uh, oh, sorry. No, uh, the the end of the last Sunday of the month. Okay, the last Sunday of the month. For uh, up to date details, go to berkeleymonastery.org. Okay, 180 online on YouTube. Super. All right, there we go. Let us transfer the merit. And when this dedication of merit is an important practice because it goes from our minds out to the world. And uh, because there are no fences in space where minds don't touch, as far as our hearts allow, as, as clear as we focus, as much ignorance as we banish from our minds, that's how far the transference goes. And likewise, our, we had magpies in bird form outside, but you can imagine that spiritual beings, ghosts and spirits, beings who are alive but not in a body, are also in the field of our dedication, right? So if we transfer merit with a wide open heart, uh, the, it, the, the force of goodness that's generated is considerable and important and valuable, right? So let's really put our hearts behind our transference. However you would like to send out your wishes for well-being, please do it now. Here we go. of peace with hearts of goodness luminous and bright if people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity may our minds away to great compassion wisdom and to joy May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. One more. May all become compassionate and wise. You all would like to join me in bowing. We can bow, three bows. First bow, second bow. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Omitovo, everybody, see you all next week. Bye-bye.